but I think here's where we're ready to pick up now with our, I've had some new material in there, but total new material is we're ready for the next word. I did last week, real quickly, and just to remind you, after Bereshit, Bara Elohim is a simple word in English. It's spelled et. It really could have been spelled with an A because that would be closer because what it's saying is the A stands for the olive which is the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and the T stands for the top, which is the last letter in the Hebrew olive bait. And it would be, like I say, everything from A to Z. Okay? There's nothing on either side of A or Z. A to Z covers the whole thing. And that word basically is saying, in the beginning, God created everything. It's all in there. That's our fourth word. You all realize you've learned Hebrew? You can quote Hebrew now. You can say Hebrew. You can read Hebrew. You're coming right along. You, I give you all an A. <laughs> I don't know about that. The, the next word, and I'm in Genesis 1, if you want to go there with me, because we are actually taking it um, right from the very beginning. And, we, we, you know, we go word by word, phrase by phrase. So we've gone now with, in the beginning, God created and now our phrase is the heavens and the earth, okay? Now, if we look at it in the plural, I was going to have it up here. Um, okay, I've got to open up another one. While I'm opening it up, um, let me say it to you. In, in the Hebrew, what we're going to see is that the Hebrew confirms its plural. And why do I go back to the Hebrew? Because we want the... Um original language as much as we can possibly do it it's like when you have learned a language and you speak in that language if you learn another language unless you're a, a linguistic you're going to lose in that second language you don't have the depth you don't have the command of all of the words so I've had a couple of dear dear friends in my life Israeli English was not their second language one was brilliant not that the other wasn't but the one I'm thinking of right now was brilliant uh, great command of English. Um, I was very jealous of his Hebrew. He'd sit there in the same Bible class with me with his Bible in Hebrew only, where I'm trying to catch up with an interlinear. But every once in a while, even though he had a great command of the English language, he would come up with a word he didn't know or a concept he didn't understand. And if we could find a way to get it back into the Hebrew form, then it's like, oh, I get it. Okay, well, that's what I'm trying to bring you. Hebrew has many, oh, I get it, moments in it when you get that full depth. So I hope it's blessing you like it does me. Hashmaim is a word for the heavens. So in the beginning, we do see God created the heavens, plural. This is referring to space, okay? It's not referring to God's abode saying that God created his heaven. He's talking about the heavens in relation to our earth. It's the heavens above our earth, okay? It indicates it's the creation of our universe, not just our earth. There's more than just the earth that is in the heavens. We know that, planets and other galaxies and all of that. But as a question was asked earlier, when I was giving a description of all these galaxies and how big the heavens are, have I touched on God's heaven? Is God's heaven... A galaxy in the middle of that? No. God's heaven is higher than that and greater than that. I have no idea. But in my mind, I have a feeling heaven is endless. A different dimension. A different dimension. And I think there's no borders. I don't think you can say, oh, I've gone all the way around the block. No. <laughs> Even when you've been there a million years. <laughs> I think it's it's freed from our dimensions. I was going to say dimensional, but that's one word, our dimensions. Again, we have to always remind ourselves we are finite, trying to understand the infinite, and we cannot get there. The brainiacs in your life, the brainiacs of this world, can't get there. God help me. <laughs> Loretta. Yeah, because we're not going to worry about the borders. We're going to be so enchanted with God and his son, the glow, the atmosphere, 
Who's going to think about if there's an end? There ain't no end. No, but I think we're going to have fun exploring. That's it. <laughs> I look forward to exploring. I want to fly by some of what I've seen from the Hubble telescope. Huh. I want to see some of those up close and personal. I hope God has some way of showing us his creation story because I want to see that. Mm -hmm. We're going to have field trips. Yes, uh -huh. there you go. Have field uh -huh. trips. And we got to put that word in quotes, don't we? You <laughs> said there's more than one galaxy. Then that's going to go with what people think of as, what is, what is it? Um, aliens, which I don't believe in. The only thing that I think is alien is against God. Satan oh, okay. is demons. We know that there's pr the prince of the power of the air, Satan. We know that there's fallen angels that do his dastardly deeds. There, there is your, your uh, battle in the skies, in our heavens. But God's heaven is above that. God's heaven is beyond that. It's not touched by that. But we do see heavens in the plural. And again, a little bit more to say about that coming up real shortly. I will say it before the class if I don't get there. So in the beginning, when God created this earth, he created the heavens. And we'll talk about those heavens. Can you, but it, I'm sorry, can you write the Hebrew of that? Uh, I'll look at it again. I cannot, I won't write it in the Hebrew because okay. uh, that would just take yeah. me time and it would be sloppy and I could show it in my tablet better. That's fine. But um, it's the heavens all rolled into one word because that's how the Hebrew does it. Um, so it's hot, which is V. And then again, this is going to be just one spelling, but it's probably the closest to the Hebrew. Um, some will do it with an H in there. Sha, my, im. Okay, that's not maybe the closest, but that's close. Yeah, that's close to it. This one left the H out, but you hear it. You hear the sh sound. So, uh, because it's the letter shin, and there's a letter sin, and that doesn't mean sin like we sin, but it gives the S sound. The same way our C can be a S or a K. They have two for an S sound, one that's a S sound, and one that's a SH sound, and this is a SH sound. So I put it in there because to me that's a little more what you're, what will help you see it. So in the beginning, Bereshit, Barah, Elohim, Et, Ha, Shmaim, and then we have the connector word and, which I'm not even sure how to pronounce it in Hebrew. It's one of those words I struggle with, what et or something like that. But then we have Eretz. Eretz is the word for earth. I will spell that. And often you will hear Eretz Yisrael. That means the land of Israel. Eretz is land or Eretz in this case is earth. You just did the whole first verse in Hebrew. Mazel tov. <laughs> That's congratulations for any of you who are in the dark on that word. Okay, so we're told in the beginning God created our earth. The earth would be the land, the, the globe that we're accustomed to, the ground, the land. Um, I can't say more than that. I'll get myself in trouble. Okay, and the heavens. The heavens start with the air we breathe. Okay, but it, we'll see how high it goes up. Now, it's very interesting, again, because philosophies... They all begin with man and try to work man up to God. God, the Bible, starts with God and works down to man. Because he had to come down to us. We can't ever get up to him. Okay, we are ready for verse 2. Are you amazed? <laughs> okay, verse 2. And I won't go all the way through Genesis word by word in Hebrew for two reasons. One, it will be here 10 years, and two, Rochelle doesn't know enough Hebrew. <laughs> so you might think, oh, she really knows her Hebrew. No, I have good sources that help me. I have a basic understanding, and the Lord enables me to use it in my teaching, but I am not a Hebrew scholar. So if you come up against someone who is, who says, well, she was close, but listen to them. <laughs> okay? I don't want to sound, you know, better than I am. There are some words we have studied thoroughly, though, and there's a word coming up in this that is critically important. And that is the word translated in our English, was. Okay? Um, in, in, let me read you to, in the English first. The whole phrase that we're looking at in verse 2 is, the earth was formless and void. Okay? Now, formless, think about that. Ooze with no shape. Okay? Formless. Void. If something's void, it's lacking. It doesn't have something. It's void. 
okay? You're not going to say something's void if it's full. So this is telling us that this earth was lacking and it didn't have shape, all right? Well, we got a little problem because those words that I've just read in our Hebrew, where's my marker? There it is. Okay, I hope you all got this because I'm trying to keep it in the middle where everybody can see. Tohu, and then it sounds like the b sound, but in Hebrew, the B is a lot like the V. So it's to tohu the bohu. Okay? Tohu the bohu. Now I'll tell you what those words mean in a minute. Well, I already really told you. Told you. That's where we're reading the earth was. Tohu the Bahu, okay? It was formless and void. Now, I want to show you we got a problem. Run with me over to Isaiah, Yeshia, and know that I 100% believe that every word of the Bible is inspired by God. Every word is true. We cannot find one mistake. We cannot find one disagreement, or we can't trust any of it. It's either all 100% or who's going to say which parts are right and which parts are wrong? When God says that he made the word of God inerrant, that means no errors. That doesn't mean one error. That means no errors. I fully believe that. So, when I read in Isaiah 45 and verse 18, I'm on the tablet, for thus says the Lord. Okay, I'm getting the Lord's word on this. The Lord who created the heavens. He is the God who formed the earth and he made it. He established it and he did not create it. And depending on what you're reading in, um, if you read it in the King James, he did not create it without form and void. Okay? In my New American, it says he didn't create it a waste place. If I take you to the Hebrew of Isaiah 45, 18... I will tell you it's the same Hebrew in Isaiah 45, 18 and in Genesis 1, 2. So I have a conflict. Isaiah says God did not do this. Oops, yeah, 18. Isaiah says God did not create the world without form and void, tohu bavohu. And Genesis says the earth was without form and void. So what do I do? I go back to the original language. And when I go back to the original language, I go to that word was. Okay? And that word, and if I can say it in the Hebrew, it's popping up for me. Boy, this is slow here today. Okay. All right. Ha, let me let me see it. Oh, haya is the root. I can do the root. Okay? So the word was in our Hebrew, the root word is haya. H-A-Y-A-H. We'll put it that way, okay? But you say haya. That's the word was. But when you look at the root word meaning, the idea is it became or it, it could become. It's talking about time. I've got a whole page. Here we go. Okay. Come to pass. It has another word, yahi, which is close to the haya very closely related. We're going to see it in verse 3, where in English it says, let there be. That gives you the idea there's a time involvement here. So what we're seeing is, rather than say that the earth was created without form and void, which is opposite of Isaiah, we're saying that the earth became without form and void. Okay? If we see it that way, that it became, across that was, it became without form and void, then that would agree with Isaiah who told us God didn't create it that way. Now, I'll just give you an argument out of basic understanding of God, in my mind, okay? God is perfect. When God created, boom, is created. Is God capable, and I say that in quotes, <laughs> because everybody will say, can God sin? Can God do this, you know that? Is God able to create chaos, to create substandard, to create incomplete, to create imperfect? And I'll tell you, I don't think so. Because as soon as the word is out of God's mouth, it's done. It's not caught in a time frame like we're in. 
And here's where, again, slip off of your, your understanding in, in your human realm because we don't understand the concept of no time. We can't catch that really and understand it. Everything to us has a beginning and has an end. When we're told God always was and God always will be, we say, okay, I'll take that by faith. When we're told we will be forever, we take it by faith because there's nothing we can point to in this world that's forever. Everything in this world is crumbling. Everything is under, we know, the curse. So I don't think that God could create that way because it's an imperfect, it's a substandard. It doesn't relate. But I'll give you other um, proofs as we go along also because if this is true, if it, and by the way, tohu, if you want it from the Hebrew, tohu means formlessness, confusion, nothingness, void. That's the way, why they translate it void. Bohu or vohu means emptiness, desolation, okay? All of that is the idea behind the Hebrew words. Now, if it's true that the earth became without form and void, we should see evidence of that somewhere. We should be told something. It should be somewhere in scripture. I'm not looking to outside sources. I can look at outside sources to prove the Word of God, but I'm going to start with the Word of God first, okay? Now, um, and by the way, whether you like it or not, they love to give a name to this. They say that between verse 1 and verse 2 was a gap of time. So if you hear someone say this is the gap theory, yes, it's the gap theory. But as soon as I say that, let me open your minds to the fact that there are different definitions of the gap theory or different points under it. We're not going to go into all those different points. Some say that all of the time periods could fit in Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2, and they believe it according to the gap theory, and some say the gap theory doesn't have to have that. So what I'm trying to say is there's, I'm giving you a synopsis. I'm not giving you every detail of the gap theory. But the gap theory is saying that there's this time element that we've missed in our English that's there in our Hebrew. So let's see if there's proof somewhere else, okay? Question. Verse 1, what did God create? The earth. Test question. The heavens and the earth. Yay, I love it. Y'all did it together. The heavens <laughs> and the earth, okay? If he created both, and he's talking about a creation that seems to be at the same time in relation with each other, then one of my questions is, if he created the earth without form and void, should the heavens be without form and void also? Why would one be a completed state and the other an incompleted state if they're being created in the same time in relation with each other? Well, that's where his home is, is in heaven. We're talking God's heaven is above that. I'm talking our heavens, okay? There's three layers to heaven. There's the air that we breathe. There's where our birdies fly. <laughs> and there's where the planets are, okay? Because it's time to answer that question, Nancy. <laughs> Say it again, the birds are the one. The, no, number one is air you're breathing. That's okay. part of the heavens. You're breathing heavenly air. You're not breathing God's heavenly air, <laughs> but you're breathing heavenly air, okay? Then the second layer of heaven, when they talk about the three layers of heaven, is where the birds fly in the sky, okay? They're up a little higher than us. But don't they need air to breathe? Absolutely they do. They're breathing heavenly air also. Just it's another layer, okay? Then there's the third heaven, and the third heaven is where the planets are, okay? Now, Paul did equate in that. He said he was caught up to the third heaven. He didn't know if he was caught up dead or alive, that he saw into the heavens. So somehow, because some will say there's many layers of heaven, and I'm not here to argue that. If they can prove that scientifically, the scripture gives room for that. All I know is God's above, that he's not stuck in our galaxy. He's beyond our galaxy. He created the galaxy, so his heaven has to be above our galaxies. Maybe it's, it's in the same sphere as our galaxies? I don't know because I have not been there, <laughs> but it's at least above, it's not below, okay? There's nobody looking up 
how I say it, nobody looking down on God's heaven, okay? He's, right. he's the ultimate. Which, uh, okay. the, the way I, I take it is like the air we breathe, breathe and uh, where the birds fly, mm -hmm. that will be, to me, the first. Mm -hmm. The okay. second will be the galaxy. The celestial, and then and the third. The third Okay. I would think that that's atmosphere. how Paul was referring to it. Yeah. Uh, that's why I take it when I read okay. it. Okay, and that's a better correction for what, what I've got here. I'll, I'll take that instead on that because I believe that is a little bit better. So we're bringing the birds down to our level, and yep. we do. We share the same air. They even yeah. come down yeah. and exactly. sit on our us. Atmosphere. And, yeah, so yeah. our atmosphere, yeah. then the, the, the galaxies. And then God being the third yeah. heaven. That, there you go. There you go. I probably made that mistake, and my apologies got mm -hmm. me on the right that, track. That, that's okay. not why that, the reason why I made a comment is because that's how I interpret it, and that's when mm -hmm. when Paul was saying because he's the the third. So it has to be right, know, right, right. Uh, so the air we breathe, the birds, the the galaxies, and the stars. And, and then, I mean, and that is. Amazing in itself, vast and we have, yes, we can't measure that and exactly. say, oh, it's six hundred feet to here, and it's a million feet to there, right. it's two million feet to there. No, we don't know because I've told told you the galaxies to blow our minds. Well, the other day when they went up, you know, to the edge of the Earth, and they said it was twenty miles up to the edge of the Earth. Okay, so that would be going into the sphere where you begin to have the moon and all of that, right? Because space... Because when you, when you go on a plane, it's a mile up and it flies a mile yeah. up. Right, right. And they're 20 miles. They're 19 miles beyond that. And then that, to me, is just the... Because we haven't been able yet to take man. We've taken... Um, robots or whatever you call them to Mars, you know, places. I was going to say, so where is that? Yet. That's in the galaxies. So that's Galaxy, number three. The second. The second. The second. The second. Wait, second. What, what, what I think it's saying, just three. What we're well, saying. It, it says after the third heaven. Yes. Third heaven will be okay. the, galaxies. the galaxies. I wish I could draw pictures because there's never a picture that I want. One is us and the birdies. Okay, okay. I got that. Our atmosphere. That's our atmosphere, okay? Mm -hmm. We're talking the atmosphere, what we breathe, okay? Then, secondly, we're going to say where the planets are, okay? Now, Earth is a planet, but we're talking many of the actual, well, I can be planets, okay. universes. Planet, the galaxies. Okay. Universes, universes. Galaxies. galaxies, okay? That's all the second level, okay? We know that that's above us. We know that what Dora just reported to us is that they went one, I mean, okay, they went 20 miles, right? Thank you. They went 20 miles up, and they were probably in the, the, the realm they could look down on, um, oh, come on, Rochelle, where's the brain? You know, where we, we've seen the, the pictures the from space, the, 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 the beginning. The end of our uh, atmosphere right. and the beginning, beginning of the other. Okay, so we can say that's approximately 20 miles to but get to NASA the went stratosphere. The, okay, thank oh, you. Are you guys talking about Elon yes. Musk? Okay. Now, yes. He's, He's not going very far. No, you know, but, but the NASA did. Went to the moon. The moon yeah. is and circling around our planet. Yeah, they don't agree with that. The moon is one of our, it's circling around our planet. Yes. Mm -hmm. We've sent the rover to Mars. Mars is one of the nine planets in our elliptical path, okay? Remember I said we're the Milky Way? So mm -hmm. we've begun to send spacecraft into the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. That's this second level. But we've not begun to get mm -hmm. to the galaxy that's 38.7 million light years away from Earth. They've, they've got pictures from like Hubble and that sort of thing that goes way out there. I'll show you a video. I'll get Roger to hook it up next time, get here on time. It's an 11 minute video, nine minute video, sorry. When it gets to the eighth, almost the ninth minute in it, that's where if you don't just lose it and wow, God, you are amazing and mm -hmm. awesome. I think you're not a long time. I have shown it. Yeah, but people like Julie awesome. haven't seen it, Nancy hasn't seen it, and 
You'll love seeing it again. Which video is this? Oh, wow. I don't have it with me today. I'll, I can get it to you earlier or I can show it to you. We'll show it on the screen next week. And Zoom people, I'll have the address for you so you all can watch it on your equipment at home at the same time we're watching it here. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's amazing. And that's way out there and it's God's what God's created. But that's still in the stars. Here's your stars, your galaxies, your universe, all of that. Nobody, I don't care how long they try and how well they do, nobody's going to be able to get in a rocket or a spaceship or a who whatsoever and get to get all the way to the third heaven. The third heaven is God's abode. Okay? Yeah, there, there's no way. The yeah. only way to enter into heaven is to shed the earthly body and to have your salvation in the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus. Then, when you leave this earthly body, you will go into the third heaven, God's above. So, the question being asked earlier, do you get higher in the heavens the more spiritual you are? <laughs> no. Now I see what is a bird. No. Do you get more reward or less reward in heaven on the basis no. of what you did for the Lord? Of course. Just the same way as we do here on this earth. You know, when you were a teacher, when you were a, a parent, and you rewarded or took away a reward from a child the same way, okay? But, hear this clearly. When you're in heaven, notice you're in heaven, getting your rewards, you're already in heaven. Okay, that means that you don't lose your salvation. You don't get kicked out of heaven and told, oops, you don't belong here. You've got to go the other way. You lose reward. You don't get some of the jewels and the crowns and who knows what else God has for us. But you're in heaven. Nobody gets into heaven by accident. Oops, you don't belong. <laughs> wouldn't that be funny? Well, it wouldn't be funny. The way you said it, you can't see the way you looked. I may be funny, but it's not a funny concept. Maria? No, I'm just saying that you said not, not by what we know more about, about uh, uh, God or about the Lord, I mean about the scriptures, but it will it will actually um, enhance right and it will it, it yes. will uh, for us to be it will be more desirable for yes. us yes yes John Corson I give credit where credit's due he's pastor like of him. Applegate Fellowship in Oregon he goes all over preaching and yes I like him too okay <laughs> I think he's got a little insight he said you know when you go to Disneyland and you take a little child with you. The little child is thrilled by Disneyland, loves Disneyland, enjoys Disneyland. But all of those puns, you know, like on the Jungle Cruise, all those double puns, all the hidden Mickey Mouses, the, the degree of detail that's been put into that, the designs, the creations, all of that are lost on that little yeah. three-year-old. Now that three-year-old's having the time of their life. They don't know they're lacking. I could give proof from Eyewitness testimony of a three-year-old I babysat for when he came home. When he first went, his, little, his older sister had been telling him how great Disneyland was. We're telling people how great heaven is, okay? He's all built up for that. And they get to Disneyland and they walk a long ways from the, where they parked the car for a three-year-old. And this is back in the day, you know, this is not all the fast track stuff today. He gets into Disneyland. He's all excited. They go stand in a line. <laughs> That's a long line, a little three-year-old. I don't know how long it was, but all his parents heard was, when are we going to go home? <laughs> when are, are we, we going to go home? <laughs> he was done. He, it was disappointing. They got on one ride. This little guy went from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Oh. He didn't take a nap. Wow. He didn't oh, stop, boy. and they never heard, when are we going to go home again? <laughs> <laughs> he got back to the car literally fell into the back seat out yeah. and his daddy carries him into the house I can still see him in his little hammock position with his head uh, his hat with his name on it you know like the get cockeyed and the biggest smile on his oh, face yeah. <laughs> that's a great advertisement for Disneyland he had a blast but he was three 
Now let that three-year-old grow up, let him be an adult and go to Disneyland with his three-year-old. And he enjoys it so much more and he gets so much more out of it. There's more pleasures. John said, I don't want any little three-year-olds in heaven. Yeah. I want you all to be able to enjoy adult level heaven. Yeah. The three-year-old isn't going to realize he's lacking, but grow up in the Lord. Do for the Lord. Learn from the Lord. Be more like him. Get the understanding. Get to know him. Get to know where you're going to go. Mm -hmm. Any of you go on vacation by just opening up the map and going, mm, ding, <laughs> okay, I'm going to go here. No matter what the weather's like, I'm just going to go there. I'm, I'll pack a suitcase. I don't know. Maybe I'll pack all warm clothes and I'll get there and it's 100 degrees and I'll fry. Maybe it'll be as cold as Siberia and I'll be a frozen chosen. <laughs> <laughs> but nobody does that. You've got a destination you're going. You study it. What do I need to wear? What do I need to know? What do I need to take? What's it like? How come people aren't paying attention to their eternal destination? Don't you want to be prepared for it? Don't you want to be ready? This is what I say. People are wrapped around the world revolves around each of them, each only person. And this world is passing on away. It, on itself. Yeah, and on itself, yes. Okay, back on track. Yes, Sam. Unmute yourself. Uh, I was thinking you mentioned different dimensions and <clears throat> I was thinking that maybe it would it be possible that the the heaven where our Lord resides is a dimension that would could be thought of more as spirit because everyone who will be there has is has in their heart the spirit of God and that would be our unity and one reason why those who don't know the Lord can't be there is that there's no identity, there's no residence to, to I be part I hear you in its validity to some degree, but even the unsaved have spirit in them. And that no, spirit will go into the eternal abyss apart from. So I, I would refer to the Holy Spirit. In that, that each each of us will have be identified with our, our Heavenly Father and that his spirit will be resident within us. Okay, but that's true even now. Um, I, I, I get your point, but I think it will phrase around the edges. Um, okay. And, and also, too, I want people to understand heaven is tangible. We have roads. We have a whole tabernacle up in heaven. We have, you know, it's not just the gold streets. We have fields in heaven. We don't know what all we have in heaven. It's the perfection of earth. It's not what we see and how we see it. You know, the, the, that joke that goes, and I don't want to take too much time, but the, you know, the, the guy got permission to bring one suitcase into heaven. It was the exception to the rule. And, you know, he's so excited he gets to take his, his best treasure with him to heaven. And he gets into heaven. They open up the suitcase to see what he brought. Well, he brought gold bricks. And they looked at him and said, asphalt? You brought asphalt? You know, gold is what the streets are yeah. made out of in heaven. So, yeah, and, and maybe you have some understanding that I'm not catching by what you're saying right now. It is um, spirit form. We're not flesh and blood. But we are still, we've got the body like Messiah's risen body, which was still flesh. It was flesh and bone. There was no blood in him. Now his blood had been shed. For us, life of the flesh is in the blood. In the heavenly, that, that's not. You know, we're in the spirit. We know we're, we're a new us, a, the, the perfect us. So everybody says, okay, well then what's that age and what's that look like? I don't know. Ask God, but it'll be the perfect you. 35, I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I think it's, you know, when, when God leaves, so I think that's what the, maybe is that that does it gives us His Spirit, but it's not the Holy Spirit. It's to give us life in order for us to be active here. But that returns to Him. Right, right. But we but do have Holy the Holy Spirit, Spirit within us who are believers now. Right, but that's through Jesus. Yes, through through accepting His shed blood. And I think maybe yes. that's what she's trying to say, like when we, we are first born. You know that gives us that the life, but it's just the physical life, right. not the, the spiritual life. 
Right. Um, I don't know, maybe. I don't no, know. because we're actually born with a part of us, and I'm just beginning to study in depth in the Hebrew, so I'll come out with more later, the difference between soul and spirit. Um, and what the fall did to bring them down where we almost can't see the difference, but yet there is, and the spirituality will make that difference. But I've got to, I'm digging. i got to, I got to digest before yeah. I can give. Um, but we all are, the, the spirit that's in us lives eternally. So it's not just the physical life. That physical life will pass away if we're not raptured. You know, it will pass away. But, and anyone who dies now, we know that their spirit lives on. So, but I think that is, yeah, maybe the, the difference also will be like, like the spirit and soul. Yes. Because the soul is the one that, that absorbs everything that you've done, whether good or bad. And that's actually the, uh, the, the that goes into whether heaven or hell. Okay, I'm gonna because bring that, back. Because I'm gonna the, bring back to yeah, this because conversation. Because the, the body is is when you know we first breathe. Right, you know, right. And that's the body has that, that is when it goes back. Right. But the soul, and I think it's it's like it can be soul slash spirit. And see, that's where I'm working on that. There actually should be something we can comprehend as a difference, and that will come out in time. Well, when one tries to say now the soul is the seat of emotions and the spirit is the spiritual, mm -hmm. but that falls a little short. Yeah. We're, we're going to, part two coming, I don't know how soon, I'm not going to promise to you it in a week, and it may take me a long time to study, it may take me a short time to study, but you all keep working too, and come back with your feedback, I appreciate that, so I'm not shutting you out, Maria, I'm just saying... No, I, that, you know, because usually, it, it, it is one that I can't think of it, then it says it returns to God, mm -hmm. but then, uh, you know. Yeah, I think it just refers to it as a spirit returning to God in right. the scripture. But again, that's where I want to go into the Hebrew and find I know. out. That's why I think it's kind of like. Yeah. Okay. It, interesting, interesting. Um, but I want to get us through this gap theory to so point because. Hebrews 412. I'm sorry? You're in Hebrews 412 when you say soul and spirit. Yes, the dividing. <laughs> yes, Hebrews 412 does talk about the division. Very right. good. Very good, Nancy. Oh, I just had to look it up on Google. <laughs> it's okay. But Google it, can be it, a good it, friend. It, it, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so back to our gap there because I want to get to a certain point so we don't lose it for next week. If we're seeing that, if we're saying this is true, then we should see evidence in Scripture. Not this, I erased it, but, you know, the, the without form and void versus, mm. you know, created differently. Okay. Um, again, only the earth, not the universe, was said to be without form and void. If he created them both and at the same time in relation to each other as is given to us in Genesis, then why was the heavens also not without form and void? Furthermore, when we look at the earth, the earth shows signs. It bears marks of a catastrophe that's happened. I'll go into more of that later, but you know, the, you can, the scientists can tell there was water covering the earth, okay? Mm. Now, they may label it and may be right that that was Noah's flood, but they may be seeing something that's not explained by Noah's flood because the earth still would show, I just tip my hand a part of it, but we know waters are covering the face of the earth in Genesis 1-2, mm -hmm. okay? Which, by the way, since I may not get to it, the, the spirit hovering is like the mama hen that's brooding over her chicks, helping them to to, in that case, mature. I'm not going to say that, that the Spirit's helping the earth to mature, but he's bringing out of the, what has become without form and void, he's bringing form and void, form and, and what's off as a void. He's bringing form to it that we read of in the restoration, really, of the earth, okay? I'll go into that again when we really get going on that, but just a synopsis today to complete that thought. Um, so, but our, our earth does show that there's been some sort of a major catastrophe. Right. The Hebrew expression is used to describe a condition that's produced by divine judgment. Now we get that by two other texts that use these words, tohu bivohu, okay? Isaiah 34, 11. So go with me to Isaiah 34 and verse 11. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in Isaiah 34, 11, we read, 
The pelican and hedgehog will possess it. Owl and raven will dwell in it. He will stretch over it the line of desolation and the plumb line of emptiness. Okay, that emptiness, that de that devastation there. Some translations may call it confusion. I think that's the word used in the King James. That's actually bohu, the bohu. So it's talking about the, that there's a judgment that's going to happen that's going to bring an emptiness, it's going to bring a chaos, it's going to bring a void. And in Isaiah 34, it's talking, um, I think I'm looking up at verse 1, if that's where it tells it, it's not. But when you're in context, we know that it's referring probably to what is called Babylon, that there's going to be a judgment come on Babylon that will leave it devastated. Okay. Verse one, like in thirty four. Thirty four eleven yeah. is what I read. And uh, on that, that um, yes, it says God's wrath against nations. Against nations, so it even goes beyond Babylon. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. But it's God's wrath. Did you mm -hmm. catch that? God's wrath on the nations brings about tohu bavohu. Okay. So maybe there's been God's wrath on this earth that brought it into tohu bavohu. That's what I'm trying to point out. Look at Jeremiah, Jeremiah, the very next book, chapter 4 and verse 23. Jeremiah 4 and verse 23. And in 4.23 we read, I looked on the earth, and behold, it was formless and void. To the heavens they had no light. Okay, now again, either we're contradicting from Genesis, or we know that this is talking about a judgment that, in this case, is going to come on this earth, that is going to devastate this earth, where it will be formless and void, and it will have no light. If you remember Revelation, we talk about the, the heavens uh, falling, the planets falling, the stars falling. We know that the moon turns to blood. We know that there's a period of darkness on the face of the earth. What is Revelation dealing with? The judgment of God on sinful earth. So again, we see when these words are used, and in the original, again, in King James, not the original, but in King James, yeah, King James, it says, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and it goes on. It's the same words, tohu bavohu, and again, it's talking about a time of God's judgment. So if the other two times, only four times that the tohu, three times, sorry, in Scripture, that we read tohu bavohu, if the other two times are talking about divine judgment, it makes it likely that the third time, which is actually the first time in Genesis, is talking about there's been a judgment. Okay? So, yes, Dora. Is there a judgment before it, everything started? That's what we're saying. Because it's mm -hmm. telling us in the beginning. It's taking us back to the beginning. And it's saying that in the beginning, God created everything. Then it became tohu bavohu, so that a judgment came. And then we step into the judgment that brought chaos, void, formlessness on the face of this earth is now being moved on by the Spirit of God, who in essence really is restoring the mm -hmm. earth mm -hmm. to a shape that is a shape we recognize because as we go through the rest of Genesis, it gives us the creation of all that we're familiar with. We will see... Two mm -hmm. times the word create, talk about a new, a special, a miraculous creation. And other times it uh, talks about made out of something or brought into a relationship. So we're going, and we'll go through all of that in detail as we take what God created. It's going to take us a while to get through creation. God did it in six days. We're going to take more than six days, <laughs> six more than six classes. <laughs> so we haven't gotten to the place where um, God picks Satan out. No, that's one of the judgments. Okay. I'm thinking that's one of the judgments. Because, yes. Satan because was thrown out and the other one was Adam and Eve. Mm. Okay. It, it said that the, it was paved with gold and all this stuff, and all of a sudden it's all in. Okay. Uh, yeah. You are absolutely 100% on the right track. Oh, but not but there yet. I'm not there yet. <laughs> that, well, actually, we are right there. We're staring at it. <laughs> We've got to see how it fits in. But um, I would change one word because when you say that he was thrown out, people immediately are going to think about the time Satan was cast out of heaven. Mm -hmm. And we're not talking about a cast out of heaven bringing 
chaos on the earth. We're talking about what happened on the earth. It may be at the same time, it may be a different time. We'll look at that, but you're absolutely on the right track. And I give you an A, because it shows me that you've begun to retain what we have seen before. What we have to remember is when we look at our book called the Bible, we can't look at it like a normal book that you read that has chapter one to chapter, let's just say 66, because there's 66 books, okay? And every single book is in order. That chapter one happened before two, before three, before four. That's the normal. You know, that's how our stories go. But in our Bible, you have Job in the middle of what you call the Old Testament, and Job lived probably close to the very same time as Abraham maybe just slightly ahead of him in birth. So you have to realize what he's writing in Job and what he talks about happening didn't happen after all the way down you've gotten past Moses and you've gotten past, you know, even, even around, I don't know if it goes as far as King David. But anyway. But the Job was the first book, actually. It, it, it should have been. It, it really should have been. been. Yeah. Yes, except for the fact that Genesis is going to tell us how it all got started. Right, right. Yeah, but we have to take these things and we have to bring mm -hmm. them in. I'm reading right now through the chronological Bible mm -hmm. that takes the Bible and it splits everything in where it belongs according mm -hmm. to their knowledge, to the best of their ability. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting to see it in that way. So I started with creation and the next thing I know is I'm reading through the entire book of Job. I haven't made it past that yet, but so far how not far I am <laughs> but we have to realize that so when we're looking at this and we're saying there's a time gap I keep forgetting it's not there a time gap between verses 1 and 2 we go looking elsewhere in scripture but it doesn't mean it didn't happen till way down there we read about it in Isaiah's book because God gave Isaiah the, the prophet who's speaking prophetically who's speaking by the Holy Spirit coming on him words that help us go back and understand back here the same way there's also words that tell us what's coming in the future we know that daniel's prophecy has not been fulfilled it's been begun but it's not been completed there's a whole gap in between there so we have to bring it all in and when we bring it in then we see that yes and i'm, I'm totally out of time to do it today it's where we'll start next week probably without a review except for the fact of exactly what we're on right now um, but we're going to look at, and if you want to read it ahead of time, read Isaiah 14, 12 to 17. It's on your cross-references. And read Ezekiel 28, 12 to 18. We are going to Wait, see... It's on your cross-references. Those of you who have cross-references, you don't Where? need this. Those of you who do need it, Isaiah 14, 12 to 17. Okay. 14. Isaiah 14, 12 to 17. And then you want to read Ezekiel 28, 12 to 18. Now, I'm not going to tell you, you're going to understand every line. I'm not going to tell you when we're done studying that we understand every line. But I think we're going to get the gist of it and the understanding of it. And we're going to see that these two sections of scripture are speaking to something that happened. That something that happened that resulted in a judgment could very well be the answer to what happened between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. Okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I lost you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I see the wheels turning, but there's no chain on there. <laughs> Read what? Read these. Read those two. Okay. Yeah. But don't worry if you don't fully understand. Okay? Even when we're done. Honestly, there's phrases in there I'm struggling with. I'm asking for the Holy Spirit to give me understanding. We may not get understanding for every word, but we can get the overall idea. The same way that in your math class, you were introduced to a new concept. And the first day, you're like, okay, I, I get that a little bit. But as you go on and you get better in your math, oh, I get that now. I understand that now. So that as adults... We don't struggle with addition and subtraction, but a, a first grader does, okay? We are like that in scripture. We can get the idea and begin to work with addition and subtraction, but later we're going to realize how valuable that is in, in multiplication and division. We may not get everything because scripture's beyond us, but we can get enough understanding that we're on that right track. 
we have the Holy Spirit within us to help us understand. So we will look at those scriptures. We'll read over them. I'm not going to take and just um, dissect every, every line, every phrase. But we'll get the overall and we'll see. You want to ask yourself, who is it talking about? Okay? What happened? And obviously, you've got already for me when I think it happened. All right? Um, I think I have to wait on my last point to fill in with it till I have given that to you also. So um, let me give you, if I can find it quick, one note to end on. Yeah, I love this. This is going to come up again later, but this is this is free for today. <laughs> okay? Just end on that science note that just blows the mind again. Um, and by the way, that, that government aid that was used to spend to find out if there was um, life out there, they spent a hundred million dollars. Um, at one point they were spending a hundred million a year to see if there was extraterrestrial intelligence out there. And somebody who was writing the book said, it might have been wiser to spend the money cultivating intelligent life in Washington. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> that was good. But I want to end on that note. I laughed at that, but this is what I love. This is our God. This is how awesome he is. This is my favorite word, how ineffable. We can't contain them, and we can't put them into a phrase. It just won't work. <coughs> now, you take into account all that's necessary for the sustenance of life, okay, as we know it. There are very few planets that can support life. We know Earth can support life. We're looking to see if there's any other planet out there that can. We have to take into account factors such as our galaxy, the star location, the stars in relation to the Earth. We've already talked about that. Too close, what would happen? Too far away, what would happen? Remember, the sun is a star. You know, too close, we burn up. Too far away, we freeze. Okay, the star age, the star mass, the star color, the distance from stars, the axis tilt, how much we're tilted, the rotation period, the surface of gravity, we touched on gravity today and how important it is, the tidal force, the magnetic field, the oxygen quantity in atmosphere, you ever notice that we don't worry, am I going to have enough air to breathe today? <laughs> Do you wake up in a panic and say, oh God, give me enough air around me to breathe today? We take that for granted, but there has to be that right balance. We know it has to be carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide, breathing in, breathing out. We know that interchange, okay? The atmospheric pressure, that's why our astronauts have to wear suits. They can't just go into outer space like I am, okay? There's 20 other important factors. I've just named a few. There's 20 more important factors like that. Now, the probability of all 33 occurrences happening on any one planet, all these 33 things that are necessary for life as we know it, is 1 in 10 to the 42nd power. You know what that means? Drop 42 zeros after that 10. And that's the chance of all 33 of those occurrences interacting, the probability of them happening on any one planet to sustain life. Now, here's the kicker. The total number of possible planets in the universe that we know at this point <laughs> is 10 to the 22nd power. That means you can take every planet that's been discovered out there, all the planets that we know that are there, and we run out of planets before we get one where all 33 occurrences have come together to give us life. That's how come I keep telling everybody that keeps saying about the global warming and stuff like that. You think God didn't know that this was happening and he didn't give us enough of everything? And Crazy. if evolution is right and everything is improving, then why do the scientists tell us that we are on a countdown clock? That in time our sun will burn out. And oh, don't worry because that's four to five million years off, so it's not going to happen to you. It would happen to your great, 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 you know, progeny down the line. And I will not give you the source. I will just say from one who is of a science mind, I have heard. And don't worry even then because we're already working on how to get out of this <laughs> universe, travel into a different universe where we'll be able to go on living. So by the time 
we know that this earth is in trouble, we'll know how to warp into whatever we need to to go on living. So you don't even have to worry about your great, 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 greats. Okay, but evolution says it's all getting better. It's improving. Why are we going to run into a problem on planet Earth if it's improving? But I remember when I was young, really young, and they were <laughs> and they were talking when you would run out of land to build houses. That's not happened. So there's always something. And they'll run out of food, but if this world was right and there was no greed and no selfishness and we worked together, we could feed the entire world. Sadly, we don't do that. But I take you back again and I close on this note. The 33 occurrences that all came together we read about right here because God created it inhabitable to put man there. That's also why God didn't create man on day one because he's creating what man's going to live in or recreating or restoring or however we need to put it. Some we will see we'll see original creation, some we will see restoration. But that is an awesome, amazing God and they'll waste every cent spending and trying to find the life somewhere else. Doesn't your scripture that you were referring to earlier, um, Isaiah 40, 12, doesn't that tell us that God measured the waters and he, he moved the mountains, yada, yada, that, that everything that he was... God put together everything that humanity was going to need all the oxygen, all the water, all the land, all... all the he, yeah. he planned all that. That's what that scripture says. He planned all that. Yeah. He measured it all. Yeah. Balanced it so all. So that from the beginning to the very end, mm -hmm. everybody would have what they needed mm -hmm. to live on this earth. Mm -hmm. And take with that, I think it's chapter 38 of Job. I haven't gotten that far yet. I can't wait till I get there. Chapter but 38 who? I think it's 38. It's right Job. around there. Job. The end of Job? No, Job. 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 Where Job's finally, in, in his frustration, he's lashed out at God, and God's pulling him up short and saying, yeah. where were you? Mm -hmm. Where were you when I told the water where it stopped on the sand? Where were you when I created? And he gives this whole, and if you ever hear it, like I got to hear once on a screen that was the size of a wall that was showing what was being said in, in um, time photography so that you would go from a bud to a flower with a booming voice like God's booming voice. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? Camera may not be able to see me in good. But this is how I would be too, exactly like Job was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, God. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Why did I Absolutely. open my mouth? <laughs> <laughs> and, and he did say, you know, woe is me. Woe is me if I'm clean lips. He, he was pulled up short. I understand why he finally, you know, in his frustration, but even then God didn't let him off the hook. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> and I love it because when you get concerned about your problem, just hear God say, ah, 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 ah. excuse me, I can do all this, and I can't take that, take care of that measly little issue yeah. that you think is a huge mountain. Well, it was to him, and he lost everything. Yes, it was, and it is to us, knowing. and it is to us. We're just as human as Joe. In fact, I respect Joe. Mm -hmm. He was a great character of God, and I mean character in the right way. I respect him. I Can you imagine uh, being him? Nope. Losing everything, losing it so rapidly, and I mean, he lost, he didn't just lose a possession, he lost family, he lost children, <clears throat> he, ah. Uh, Why he did not lose his wife. <laughs> And people rip her apart, but you know what? I see I see her in a different light, though, and we'll find out when we get home. Yeah. But in my mind, when she says to him, curse God and die, I don't think she's meaning it like Job's friends who were saying, you've been such a sinner, you know, repent from your sins, confess it so that God gets off your back, which was not true, and we knew it. But I think she was hurting so much for her husband, mm -hmm. for herself too. She's mm -hmm. lost those children too. She gave birth to those babies. You can't like tell me she wasn't hurt. And saying, I think, well, I think in her frustration <laughs> and the agony and the pain, she just said, 
you know, just, just curse God and die. Just curse him and get it over with so at least you can get out of your pain because they believed in the resurrection. Mm -hmm. Job, oh, I'll get the reference for you, says that he knew that he would see the day when his Redeemer, you know, when his Redeemer lived, he would be there. I'm doing a terrible job. I'll give you that verse next week. What was uh, good, the guy that was really coming against Job, God, took it, he punished him. That was Satan coming against Job. Mm -hmm. Or you mean the, the Job? God well, punished him for what he was doing to Job, you know, that negative. The, the three friends that came? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And don't judge your fellow believer, especially if they're needing camaraderie and you know if they're if they're doing something obviously that is bringing judgment on them and God's put you in that position to walk through it with them to help them see the error of their ways to change that's one thing but then do that in love do that with yes. with the grace that says what if that were me how would I want to be treated but most of the time I think we that's not the position we need to be in God's the judge and we need to be there praying for them and supporting them right. through it. And I, think, and, and I really think she just was at her wit's end and she was just hurting so bad too. It was, let's just let's just get it over with. And I think also we can see Job, a representation of Christ. You know, oh, absolutely. Because of, because of him. And, and God says, I, I will not punish you, the three, because of him. When anybody wants to say... God put too much on them, or you know anything like that. If you haven't suffered to the degree that Jesus did, mm. close your mouth, zip your lips, sit down, and take a lesson, and go to Hebrews 11, and go through that chapter of faith. Mm. And every time I want to say life is bad, I need to go read Hebrews 11. Mm. And you've been trying to get a word in edgewise. I mean, yourself, we're long past. I tried to quit early today, guys. I really did. <laughs> and I do have to get down to the church office. I want to say real quick that um, I, I join you in respecting Joe because I don't know of many people, most definitely including myself, where the Lord would say to the adversary, have you considered my service? Oh. This is true, too. He obviously was upstanding, and God knew he could withstand the trial he was in. God may stretch you. It may be, you know, the, the growing, and, and sometimes there are growing pains, but he does know your limits, who and he that? won't. God does. Who was that? Anne. I have Anne in Zoom, and I have Anne in person. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's Anne on Zoom. Anne. Yeah, poor, poor Anne in person. Sorry. <laughs> but yes, yes, good point. Is He was exemplary. And if you are exemplary, it doesn't mean that life is perfect. It, to the contrary, usually the exemplary lives are the lives that have gone through the deeper trials. But the Lord promises he's with us every step of the way. Job didn't even have scripture to open up like we do. You know, we have it right there when we need encouragement to read and to look. I just told you, go to Hebrews 11, you know, read Job 38 or 39, wherever that is, you know. He didn't even have that. And, uh, you know, and Paul himself said that he had lost one and he said God spared him the loss of another because it would have been more than he could handle. Job lost all his kids in one blow. You know, I, I've, I've heard... All his servants, all his servants, all, but each one... And the servants probably were close man. to him too. Yeah. You know, they Family. probably, there was a relationship there. I've heard wonderful testimonies of people who have lost all their family members in a car accident or something, and how it devastated them for a time, but the Lord brought them through. Yeah, wow, wow. But this God who is so creative is also, you know, the one who takes care of all creation, keeps it all in order, all that we're talking about, that magnificent God, do you know he knows when a little sparrow falls? And do you know who feeds and tends the baby sparrows? God. What love. Yes, Roger. <laughs> Job 6, 1925. Job 1925. I, my Redeemer liveth, is that? Yep. Yeah, thank you. So we get that this week. Thank you, Roger. Job 19 and verse 25. And I know as soon as I start it, I'll be able to say it, but I get that brain freeze. 
As for me, I know that my Redeemer, notice Redeemer, my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will take his stand on the earth. When does he take his stand on the earth? Revelation 19, he's taking his stand in 20, he's setting up his kingdom. Job, at the very beginning of, of the human time chain, is looking all the way. 6,000 years? It's pretty good eyesight. There in 2020. <laughs> but he knew it. And yes, he stood on his faith. What an example to all of us. I would love to say, God, let me have that kind of tenacity in you, that kind of depth in you spiritually. But honestly, Lord, I don't want to go through what he went through. Oh, I was already thinking that same yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but, but our God who loves us so made us and knows us. He knows us. We get to know ourselves all our life. Do you realize that? You are trying to find out who you are all your life. Oh, I like this. Oh, I don't like that. Oh, I do this. Oh, I don't do that. And we're changing constantly. So we're always trying to get to know us. <laughs> and the Lord says, I found you. I made you. I know you. I know your needs. He knows everything about us. He knows the number of hairs on our head. I don't know that number. <laughs> and he has to spend more time counting mine than some. <laughs> <laughs> so he looks at me, <laughs> but he looks at me with that love, and I, I so that again, puts me on my knees, <clears throat> bowing before him in humble adoration and thanksgiving. And on that note, let's give him our praise. Lord God, you are ineffable, you are awesome, you are amazing, you are love, you are grace, you are mercy. Oh, Lord. Each one of us, I know, I can speak for us all, don't want to disappoint you. We want to put our faith in you. We want to act according to your will. We want to not complain. We want to see you in the midst of our trials that we might come out victoriously and exemplary to encourage another. Lord, let it be so. Thank you that you remember that we are mere dust of the earth that you formed and brought life into that you know us and you are tender with us. Lord, thank you. Thank you for being tender. Thank you for being loving. Thank you for caring. And thank you for your perfect plan that nothing can cause to go awry. We will be with you one day, and it will be glorious forever. Hallelujah. Oh, we praise you, and we thank you, and we say it again. Hallelujah. In your name, Yeshua Jesus, our Redeemer, our Savior, O oh, name. Amen. Amen. What a God. Mm -hmm. What? Mm -hmm. And I feel that love capacity growing, so I can love it alone.